Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Mathematics and Art. My name is Danny Shapiro, and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is author, Dr. Paul Sisson. Dr. Sisson is Professor of Mathematics Emeritus and Provost Emeritus and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Louisiana State University, Shreveport. In addition to continuing to teach undergraduate and graduate mathematics throughout his career, he has served in numerous administrative capacities, including department chair, college dean, graduate studies dean, provost, and vice chancellor for academic affairs, as well as interim chancellor. Dr. Sisson's research articles in the area of infinite dimensional topological vector spaces have appeared, have appeared in Studia Mathematica and the Proceedings of the American Mathematical Society. His interests also include such diverse areas as math pedagogy and mathematical art, with articles appearing in Mathematics Magazine, College Mathematics Journal, and the Journal of Mathematics and Arts. Dr. Sisson published his first textbook with Hawks, College Algebra, in 2003, followed by Pre-Calculus in 2006, and College Algebra, A Concise Approach in 2011. Most recently, he has co-authored Calculus with Early Transcendental. Dr. Sisson's teaching experience is reflected in his textbook writing, which emphasizes the historical and human aspects of math, calls upon institutions that calls upon the intuition of the reader, and uses modern technology to enable students to explore mathematics and develop mathematical confidence. We are excited that Dr. Sisson is here with us today to share his unique and entertaining presentation. If you have any questions throughout the the presentation, please enter those into the Q&A box located on the panel either at the top or bottom of your screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. And on that note, I will hand it over to our presenter. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for checking out this presentation on mathematics and art, two of my favorite topics. Uh, you just heard a lot about me. Thank you, Danny, for that introduction. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention before I forget. I'm doing this webinar today from the office of the Manzano Mountain Art Council, which is in Mountaineer, New Mexico. So if you ever find, find yourself in the geographic center of New Mexico, uh, please be sure to stop by here and check out all the art. All right, so let's get started. Here's a, a roadmap of what we're going to be doing today. I'll start off with a short discussion of what we can think of as the art of mathematics. And I'll give you a little bit of warning right now. There are very few pictures in the Then we'll move on to the visually more interesting portion and we'll talk about the mathematics of art. And finally, I'm gonna close with a little bit of preaching uh, where I'll try to leave you with some takeaway ideas. Okay, so on to the preamble. This is a, a one-page cartoon summary by Mark Bennett of a very nice, uh, but somewhat lengthy article by Paul Lockhart, and the article is entitled a Mathematician's Lament. You can find it online, it's worth reading. The gist of the article and this cartoon is that while it's not uncommon for mathematicians to think of what we do as art, that's really not the popular perception of math at all. In one frame in this cartoon says, all artists express truth. Most of us as mathematicians think that's what we do as well. But as Lockhart says in his article, the difference between math and the other arts, such as music and painting, is that our culture does not recognize it as such. So why aren't mathematicians more commonly recognized as artists? Well, one reason is that the art we create is generally not very easily conveyed to others visually. Uh, for instance, as you heard, I work in the area of mathematics called functional analysis, and almost all of the work that we do takes place in infinite dimensional space. I have a hard enough time trying to convey three-dimensional objects on two-dimensional surfaces, such as blackboards or computer screens. So the beauty of what I do in functional analysis uh, unfortunately remains for the most part in my head. And when we do express beauty in mathematics, it often takes forms such as these. All of these familiar statements, along with thousands of others, 
conjure up deep feelings and truth in the minds of those that know the secret language. And as Keats said, beauty is truth, truth beauty. But these expressions of beauty are a bit arcane to non-mathematicians. All right, so as I said, uh, or as you heard, I'm an aspiring artist. Um, so I thought I should tackle this challenge again of trying to convey mathematical beauty. And as you heard, my first area of research was infinite dimensional topological vector spaces, but not the relatively well-behaved spaces like Hilbert space or even Bonnick spaces. The spaces that I studied have really wild and fantastic properties such as compact convex sets that don't have extreme points. They have compact operators, but they don't have linear functionals. And even for mathematicians, unless you work in the exact area of math that I worked in, everything I just said makes almost no sense. So imagine how hard it is to convey, ideally in some visual manner, the fascinating and unique beauty of those spaces. I worked long and hard on this challenge. And as you can see, I've got a long ways to go yet. So let's move on to the part where I can actually show you some pictures. Uh, what I'm going to do is briefly touch on a number of different disciplines. And all of these are more commonly thought to have artistic elements. But what I'll try to do is point out the mathematical underpinnings of the elements. And um, maybe a little bit of a confession here. I've taught classes on mathematical art. I've talked about mathematical art to non-mathematicians who for the most part are scared to death of math. I've created some different varieties of mathematical art. And actually the hardest thing I've found is talking about mathematical art to a mathematically sophisticated audience. Uh, as I put this presentation together, I've been faced with the preaching to the choir conundrum. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is not pretend that I can teach everyone here something. A lot of you already know a lot about mathematical art. And instead what I'm going to do is uh, first, try to remind everyone of at least one or two of the aesthetic attractions of mathematics. And secondly, encourage everyone who either is a teacher right now or if you're training to be a teacher to incorporate the aesthetic facets of mathematics into your own lectures and presentations whenever possible. I don't think I have anything more to add to this pithy observation. All right, so starting off easy. Uh, math, of course, plays a key role in the field of architecture for both technical and aesthetic reasons. And this is a detail of the Eiffel Tower, uh, just one of the examples of, of places where uh, triangles appear in architecture. And these cooling towers are based on hyperboloids for both structural and performance reasons. Uh, this particular um, uh, cooling tower is a, a power station in, in the uh, United Kingdom. And this is a artist's rendering of a Mobius strip inspired design for a Buddhist temple in China. This goes back in time a little bit. This was the Phillips Pavilion at the Expo 58 World's Fair in Brussels. And the part that we see the, the roof and the sides, uh, that's all constructed of nine hyperbolic paraboloids. And this is a rather famous building in London's financial district. It's known as the Gherkin. And there are many, many mathematically inspired design elements in that building. Moving on to a different discipline, discipline of music. I didn't want to mess around with audio in this presentation. Uh, so instead I'm going to fall back on another quote for, from Keats and hope you'll agree that heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. And of course, when we talk about math and music, patterns lie at the heart of both music and math. But the underlying mathematics of music also appears, for instance, in the permutations of change ring, ringing, the relationships between tones and harmonics, and why some combinations of the tones are pleasant and others are literally discordant. The Pythagoreans developed a theory of tuning and then the mathematical complexity of that topic is apparent from just the many different uh, tuning structures alone. And finally, some composers, Bach among them, 
uh, composed entire pieces based on what we now think of as group theoretic concepts, such as transposition, reflection, inversion, and translation. I'm going to move on to what I'll call three-dimensional art. This is this sculpture is in the, uh, by Pete Morehouse. The title is Mistral Number One. And from knot theory, this uh, piece of carving is by the artist Rhinus Roloffs. A mathematics is the basis of some really striking origami. And interestingly, conversely, origami has really become the basis of some very striking, intuitive, albeit informal, mathematical proofs. Origami is also a terrific teaching tool and a great way to introduce mathematics to kids. And there are uh, several really good books and websites that discuss the idea of using origami for that purpose. And here's another little bit of origami. Well, this is a depiction of the Menger sponge. And I, I say it's a depiction because this is not something that can actually be physically created in its entirety, though some sculptors have created some really beautiful approximations. Now this piece and the next actually do exist in real life. Uh, I know because I made them. This is a fused glass plate. It's nine inches by nine inches. And it depicts a Monte Carlo dartboard approximation of the number pi. Uh, this wouldn't be a math lecture without homework. So I'm gonna leave it as an exercise to all of you to work out exactly what rational number approximation this piece does represent. And this is another way of of approximating pi with a rational number. This is based on the Buffon needle problem. This is a, a piece of jewelry by Bulatov. Uh, I haven't seen him recently, but he, he used to show up at math conferences and have his jewelry for sale. I bought several of his pieces over the years. And this is a really beautiful piece of uh, sculpture by the very talented artist, Robert Longhurst. Now there's a, a lot of math behind that last piece. So here's the, uh, here's the mathematical story behind it and why it shows up as the cover of the uh, calculus book that my co-author and I finished up a couple of years ago. When we finished up our book, our editor got in touch with us and, and said, terrific, uh, you've done all the hard work, which was uh, seven years of writing. Now you need a cover for the book. And so I, I started to look around for inspiration. I didn't really have anything in mind at the time, but I, of course I wanted something that was mathematical and aesthetically attractive. And I, I pretty quickly ran across uh, the work of, of Longhurst online and I, along with many other mathematicians, we were just really attracted to, to his work. Uh, so I got in touch with him. He's, he's alive and, and still doing uh, really uh, terrific work. I uh, wrote him an email and I asked him two questions. First, uh, would, would he give us permission to use a, a photo of his work on the cover of a book? And secondly, and more important for me, uh, I asked, what is the mathematical background or the mathematical inspiration for this piece in particular. And he, he, was, he was very quick to respond. He's very gracious. And first he said, of course, you can, you've got permission to use my, uh, a photo of my work. That's no problem at all. Uh, but unfortunately, for the second question, he said, I am not a mathematician. I can't tell you anything about the math behind my work. Now, as I said, I'm, I'm not the first mathematician to have been attracted to his work. Lots of mathematicians have talked with him and, and made that comment that they see math in what he does. So he's aware that there is definitely a lot of, of uh, math in his work, but he approaches it in a much more intuitive, uh, artistic manner. And he doesn't actually, as he said, he's not a mathematician. So he couldn't tell me, for instance, anything about the uh, you know, what surface that is that he's depicting. So th that was, that was uh, really depressing. I didn't want to use a, a picture of his work if I couldn't actually relate it to mathematics. And I, I, I was a, a little bit um, 
skeptical of my ability to reverse engineer his work and figure out, say, a parametric description of that surface. But I, I had the sense that that was a minimal surface. To me, it just looked like it was, it was an example of a minimal surface. So I did some research and found the Anaper virus trials characterization of minimal surfaces. And amazingly, within a, less than a day, I was able to use Mathematica to, to describe mathematically uh, with uh, parametric equations that surface. And the animation that you see here is the deformation of a disk into uh, what I think is the the surface depicted by that by that carving. And once I was able to do that, then we were able to work the topics of surface area, curvature, mean curvature, uh, parametric surfaces, all these calculus topics and relate them to this, this uh, cover image in our book. All right, so let's move on to something else. Let's move on to math and art appearing in nature. Here's an example of a fractal pattern as demonstrated by Fern and another by Romanesco Broccoli. And this image depicts Fibonacci light sequences. Uh, here's, here we've got the arrangement of seeds and leaves and Fibonacci light sequences show up in, in many plants. Uh, they also show up in the arrangement of the eyes in the uh, feathers of a peacock. And back to some human creations. This piece by M.C. Escher, entitled Ascending and Descending, is a, a good example of his work. Of course, almost all of Escher's work is mathematically inspired. Here's another work by Escher. And going back in time, Melancholia by Durer. Uh, you can find this online. If you blow it up, you see all sorts of, of mathematical objects in this uh, rather famous piece, including Magic Square up in the upper right corner. And this is a, uh, just a photo of a floor, uh, a church floor in Italy. And it shows uh, just uh, one of the uh, many tiling patterns that show up in, in architecture. This is a, an example of a work by Jackson Pollock. And the really amazing thing about uh, his work, as it's been studied lately, the fractal dimension of Pollock's work gradually increased over the course of his career and it increased in a consistent and quantifiable manner. In fact, uh, now that we can photograph his work and then calculate the, the fractal dimension uh, computationally, our authenticators have been able to use the, the calculated fractal dimension of a piece to distinguish between a real Pollock and a forged creation. All right, uh, here's another piece that I made. The, uh, so this is a, actually a picture of the complex plane and the origin is right there in the middle. That gold ring around the origin is a uh, ring of radius one. And so if you can just imagine the, the real number line is running uh, horizontally, horizontally through the origin, the imaginary axis is uh, vertically through the origin. And every pixel in this image or every complex number in the complex plane is colored according to a um, according to the num number of iterations necessary as a, a certain complex value function of complex variables is is iterated and how many iterations it takes for the original complex number to wind up in that gold ring. Uh, this is a, a technique that I, I kind of hit upon by accident. I was actually trying to solve the Colatz conjecture. If you've never heard of the Colatz conjecture, I encourage you to look it up. Uh, this is something that Lothar Colatz uh, asked back in 1937. It is a very easy to describe problem. Uh, even uh, elementary school kids can understand the problem. So very easy to describe, very, very hard to solve. It is still open. 
I tried to solve it back in 1995, around that time. And I thought I had a, a visual way to get a handle on what was going on, which turns out it, it did not work. At least it did not solve the, the Colatz conjecture, but it did give me a, a way to create some really beautiful pictures. So this was one of the first images I made uh, using the technique that I had come up with. Here's another image using that same technique. And another one. And a fourth one, and this one I, I made recently, this was the uh, cover for the 2018 holiday greeting card for New Mexico Tech, which is my alma mater. So they got in touch with me, uh, had, had heard about my, my uh, math and the complex plane, and they commissioned me to, to create the cover for their holiday card. And that technique is a lot of fun to talk about. It's a lot of fun to teach. So I have taught that technique to a number of my students in various classes. And the next few slides are some of my students' creations. All right, so let's move on to the preaching part of the presentation. A few more quotes by famous mathematicians to inspire us. And a lot of what I'm going to show you in this last third of the presentation comes from calculus uh, and a lot of it uh, I created as, as we were writing our, our calculus book. Uh, so, of course, if you are teaching calculus, if you're learning calculus, the, the need to make a lot of pictures, two-dimensional, three-dimensional graphs and, and sketches, that's just really, really critical. And the, if you're writing a book or if you're, uh, if you're preparing a lecture, you, you want to, of course, come up with the best possible, most accurate uh, pictures, images as you can. I use Mathematica for things like this. And so as I made the images for our calculus book, it really struck me that so many of them were, they had mathematical content, but they were also just aesthetically very pleasing. So they're especially pleasing when, when you go through the process of actually figuring out how to make them. It is a terrific exercise for students. So I really do encourage all teachers to have their students use whatever, uh, means are at their disposal, whether that's innate sketching talent or programs like Mathematica, but use those means to create mathematical art of this form. Some of the things that you do in calculus really just call out for movement. So objects of revolution, something that you talk about a lot in calculus and using Mathematica, it's easy to actually show a uh, graph being rotated in three space and creating a, a surface. And some, some ideas that might seem really prosaic to start with, such as Newton's method as applied to a, a function of one variable. Well, when you extend that to the complex plane, you yeah, something much, much more attractive. So this is Newton's method used to, uh, it's, it's depicting the, uh, finding the cube roots of one and the colors here, well, the three different colors uh, are really just showing the, the, uh, the, the regions that uh, home in on the three different roots of unity and the shading gives you some idea of how fast the algorithm is actually cl uh, closing in on one of the three roots. Here's the same algorithm, finding the five fifth roots of unity. And here it is finding the seven seventh roots of unity. And even when you're just 
things like making residue figures. Uh, a little bit of simple animation turns that into something that's uh, pretty hard to look away from. Those of you of a certain age are probably reminded of uh, a toy called the Spirograph. And here's a, an image that results from sketching orthogonal families, solutions of a differential equation. And this is uh, just one example of an, ob an object formed in the uh, TNB frame, the tangent normal binormal frame. Using the, the tangent normal and binormal vectors, you can make objects that just seem very, very natural. They seem like they, they arise in nature. They curve the way that you expect natural objects to curve. Here's another animation. This is uh, showing what happens if you pile a whole bunch of hexagons on top of one another. Each one rotates slightly from the one below it. And it's it, 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 the, uh, the final image actually appears in our calculus book. The purpose of the final image is an illustration of Cavalieri's principle, but actually just showing all those, those uh, hexagons piling up is a nice little artistic exercise as well. All right, a few more animations. So the bottom one here is demonstrating the creation of a cycloid, and the top one is the creation of a epicycloid. And with these animations, we have just about reached the end of my preaching, the end of my talk, oh, uh, except for dessert. So this is a, a little edible piece of mathematics entitled Almond Nougatine with Sand of Pistachio. And the mathematician behind this piece is Mercedes Molina from the University of Malaga. And the chef that created it is Jose Garcia. All right, well, thank you very much. And now I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sisson. I wanna remind our audience that they can go to the question and answer box that's located on the panel at the top or bottom of the screen and uh, submit stuff, your questions there, which I can direct. We already have one question from Audrey. Um, let's see, we may need a clarifier on this, but perhaps you will know. What is the name of the conjecture? Oh, the name of the conjecture is Colatz. That's C-O-L-L-A-T-Z. And let me say just a little bit more about it, uh, because I, as I said, it's very simple. So it's so simple, I should be able to remember it and just uh, say it off the top of my head. Uh, consider the function on, on the positive uh, integers, the, the natural numbers. If you start off with an integer, if it's even, divide it by two. And if it's odd, multiply it by three and add one. And so, of course, you do that, you get another integer. Iterate that function. And the, the question, the Colatz conjecture, is if you keep on doing that, do you eventually wind up with the number one, no, no matter what natural number you start off with? Uh, that has been answered in the affirmative to something like 10 to the 33, you know, all, all natural numbers up through 10 to the 33, probably a little bit higher by now. But no one since 1937 has been able to prove that if you do that for any given natural number that you always wind up with one. So very simple to describe, very uh, easy to play around with, very easy to use something like Mathematica to uh, write a function and, and play with, very, very hard to prove. And we are getting a lot of questions wondering what tools you're using to make all of these animations. Ah, uh, good, very good question. And the answer is simple. I use Mathematica for everything. So all of the images that I made that you just saw 
were made using Mathematica. And all the images, all the, uh, the illustrations in all of my books were made using Mathematica. And is that, is that a free tool that anyone can access or do you have to pay for that? Yeah, unfortunately Mathematica is, well, it's, it's free only to uh, certain people. So for the most part, you have to buy it. But it, it is free if you happen to be a student at a campus that has a site license. Uh, so for instance, when, when I was uh, teaching at LSU Shreveport, I believe this is still the case, students at LSU Shreveport are able to use it for free. And that's because LSU Shreveport has a site license. So a lot of universities do have a similar license. If you are a student, then be thankful and take advantage of that. Use it for free as long as you can. As soon as you graduate, then you have to pay for it. And do you have any tips for getting started with Mathematica uh, for getting students into it? Um, it's, it's actually, it, it's very easy to get started. And uh, one nice thing about Mathematica is, is uh, made by the company Wolfram. And if you go to wolfram.com, there are thousands and thousands of examples of uh, doing things like, like what you just saw me do. So it's very easy, it's, it's very, very easy to use the built-in commands to do things like uh, graph functions, plot surfaces, uh, you know, simple things like that. And then with a little bit of programming and taking advantage of the demonstrations that you find at wolfram.com, then you can do some, some more uh, complicated things and, and maybe more impressive things uh, and again, it doesn't take a whole lot of work. I'm, I'm not a programmer by any means, but I do like to use Mathematica to create objects and it's, it's really pretty simple. And let's see what other questions we have. Uh, Evgenia uh, wants to thank you for the presentation and wonders in what way uh, do you envision using art to motivate concepts in college algebra? Uh, for example, log logarithmic functions. Ah. Uh, well, so what comes to mind, I guess a couple of things come to mind right away. One is just using technology to make sure that the students are able to you know, quickly get graphs of, of uh, different logarithms, logarithms to, to different bases, uh, see what happens when you shift it horizontally, left, left or right, or vertically up and down, stretch a, a graph or, or shrink it. And, you know, if, if you, if you have to manually sketch all those different graphs, it gets tedious. It's, it's not really a, a lot of fun. You can use it to just quickly come up with a picture and see uh, even better is if you uh, write a, a very quick little program and have a, a parameter that you can vary, then you can actually in real time see what happens as you vary one parameter or another and get a, a, you know, a better intuitive sense of how the, the parameters in a uh, uh, given logarithmic function, how that affects the graph. But then beyond that, you can play around with things like logarithmic spirals and, and really, you know, for those uh, students who are artistically inclined, you can send them off in that direction. And have you used uh, Desmos, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, that's an, another program that we have uh, Geraldo mentioning, are you familiar with that? I am, uh, and I've used it a little bit, uh, really only just to say that I have. So I, I can't claim to have any uh, real expertise. Uh, it is, it's a nice program, and I, I think it's a bit more, uh, maybe even a bit more accessible than Mathematica, so it's a good way to get started. Uh, it, it's, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a good tool to use. Um, I'm, I'm partial to Mathematica, but mainly just because I've used it for, for so many years. I don't want to give the impression that Mathematica is the only uh, tool to use. There are many good tools out there. And uh, Wendy has a question here about the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, you referenced that, that that was displayed in the Sunflower as an illustration of the sequence in nature. Are you familiar with other appearances of the sequence in nature? And yeah. uh, could you direct her to some more information on that subject? I, I can. Uh, actually, one I ran across just recently, and I, I haven't done any uh, real research in it myself, 
but apparently if you if you look at the the spread out feathers of a peacock and if you uh, think about the the eyes as arranged in um, spirals emanating out from the the you know from the body of the bird apparently the uh, the number of eyes uh, obey a fibonacci like structure as well i'm i'm saying fibonacci like because it's not always necessarily the classic Fibonacci sequence, but Fibonacci in the sense that uh, one number is the sum of the previous two numbers uh, in, in whatever it is that you're looking at. Okay, thank you. And uh, Charles is asking, have you any association with Bridges Math and Art Conference? It's in yeah. July in Austria. Uh, yes, uh, but only only one um, association so far. So I, I did have a couple of mathematical art pieces that were displayed at the uh, 2017 Joint Mathematics Meeting, which is uh, sponsored in part by Bridges. So I haven't been to uh, any of the other Bridges conferences, uh, but I've, I've looked at the, the artwork that shows up online and that is, is just so impressive. And we have, we do have several uh, people asking that uh, if you would be willing to share your PowerPoint slides, they love it and would like to show it to their classes. Certainly. Um, okay. I think you can say more about, so this, this video does show up um, available for everyone, right? Yes, so we will be sending this video out as a recording, um, but perhaps we can get together and uh, pick some select sides to, to send out as an additional resource for instructors as well. Sure, we can do that. And we can just, uh, if, if you can uh, arrange it, we can have it available uh, right, right next to the video. Yep, absolutely. We will include that in our email to all registrants. Okay, sounds good. And uh, Yvonne uh, says that she would probably try some probability destiny related animations. Okay. Uh, I haven't done much uh, myself, but certainly uh, I, I can I can see that a whole lot could be done in that in that way. I guess I should also mention there. You know, I, I felt like I, I had uh, enough for a presentation here, but there is so much of mathematical art that I haven't touched on. And one big topic that you can certainly spend a lot of time on is is um, the the mathematics of perspective. So both perspective theory and then how uh, different artists have, have, whether they've known it or not, they've used mathematics as they've used perspective in their work. And I thought you would like this comment, not really a question, uh, but Geraldo wanted to chime in again, thank you for the presentation and said that he strongly believes art is the way to change people's view of mathematics. I agree. It's a, uh, over and over again, I've, I've found that art is, is one of the ways to get people over a fear of mathematics and get people to think about math a different way. It's not the only way, of course, but it's, it's something that people just respond to very quickly and visually, and it gives people a, a different sense of what math is all about. And as, as I said, as um, Paul Lockhart says in his article, as many mathematicians have said, if you are a mathematician, you probably think of what you do as art. It's, a, it's all about the creation of patterns or, or, or identifying patterns. What we do is, is it's beautiful art. Unfortunately, it just too often resides in our heads and is not something that, that other people can see easily, but it is possible. And we have two tree-related comments here coming in. Uh, Barbara wanted to chime in that Fibonacci patterns also appear in pine cones. Yes, right, in pine cones. And uh, Charles is wondering if you've uh, ever worked with tree graphs. Uh, no, I don't think I have. And Charles is also wondering if you have an email address that you'd be willing to share for correspondence. Sure. Um, I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll let you put that up uh, aside the video so that everyone can refer to it later. 
but uh, just yeah, my my LSUS uh, email is the one I use for this purpose. Okay, we will absolutely make sure to include that as well. And Dr. Schiffen, I had one question as you went through. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your students have experienced when when making art. How is it rewarding? How has it helped their uh, progression in mathematics? Well, uh, I, I think without exception, the the response has been positive. Of course, it it. it changes uh, a little bit from student to student. They, they express that in different ways, but it has, every time I've taught either a class specifically on mathematics and art, or if I've just incorporated some mathematical art into some other class I'm teaching, I, I think the response is just always just extremely positive, extremely enthusiastic. And one thing I should say, when I've taught the class that is specifically called mathematics and art, that has, it's been an upper level class. It's been a, a senior level class, but it has not been only for, mar, uh, for uh, math majors. It's actually been open to anyone. I think usually when I've taught it, uh, the only uh, prereq has been college algebra. And so I've, I've intentionally tried to get uh, students from all across the campus, all across the university, no matter what their degree is to take your level math class and play around with ideas that they they probably have never encountered before and again as i just said give people a, a very different sense of, of mathematics and i think that's been the, the response so at the end of the semester people especially the non-math majors that have taken such a class they have gone on and on about how they had no idea this is what math was all about Aaron is wondering if you had a, a textbook that you would recommend for a, a mathematics and art class. Uh, no, unfortunately I don't. So when I've taught that class, specifically the, the mathematics and art class, I've made up my own notes, but the thing I've done is I've, I've had students do a, a whole lot of research on their own. The nice thing about math and art as they appear in, in our culture today is that you can find a lot online. So the way I've taught it, every week I've had a theme uh, such as um, uh, perspective or uh, my, my technique for uh, coloring the complex plane. I've had some theme and I've had students do research online to learn a lot on their own and then share, the, uh, share what they've learned with other students. Did you have a, a syllabus that you use for that each semester that we could potentially include in our, our email as well that instructors might be interested in taking a look at? Yeah, I, I, I do. And what I, that, that syllabus um, is, is mainly just a, a list week by week of the uh, different themes. So it's, it is not a very prescriptive syllabus at all, but it, it, does, it does run through the topics of uh, what I like to cover in a math mathematics and art class. So yes, uh, remind me and I'll, I'll send you that syllabus. Okay, well, wonderful. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, Dr. Siss, I wanna thank you again for this very entertaining and engaging presentation and thank our audience for so many great questions today. Yeah, uh, thank if you, do you have any, any more questions, uh, you can direct them to us at marketing at hawklearning.com or like I said, we will include Dr. Sisson's email in, in our uh, link as out as we send this recording to you. Um, you can view the, this and our other webinars on our blog at blog.hawkslearning.com. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you.